Thank you everyone for taking time out to join this webinar. I'm Vincent from Olympus Singapore. I'm the APEC product manager for the XRF and XRD products. So uh, today's topic is about identification of precious metals purity and the authenticity of gemstones by using portable XRF. Please note that this webinar will be recorded. Then if you are facing any technical issues, please feel free to uh, check in the chat box to seek for any uh, assistance from us. And also, if you have any questions about the webinar itself, please go to the Q&A tab and key in your questions. And I will be answering all questions at the end of the webinar. Okay, uh, transcript will also be available. So if you would like to uh, activate the transcript, you can go to the more options and then activate the transcript. Okay, so these are the topics that we will be talking about today. So first of all, I will discuss a little bit about the fundamentals of gold. So the type of common goals, classification of gold, manufacturing processes, uh, determine goal purity, what are some of the goal analysis methods in the market, how does XRF work, and how we can use XRF for goal analysis. Then I will share about something that's uh, interesting. I will share something about the fundamentals of gemstone, type of gemstone, and how XRF can be used for gemstone analysis. So I think this is uh, something that uh, we haven't covered about in the past uh, few years. So uh, we, with the advancement of XRF itself and our knowledge about gemstone, we started to perform more analysis into this field. And later on, I'll be showing you guys a few case studies on uh, some of the applications that we can use for gemstone analysis. And lastly, I'll just go through what are the advantages of using our Olympus Fanta. And finally, I'll go through a Q&A session. So I will be answering the questions that you guys post. Okay, so first I'll start off to talk about the fundamentals of gold. Okay, so over here, these are the type of common goals that you can see. We have the classic uh, 22 carat 916 gold. Then we do have like rose gold. So a lot of times with the different type of goals or the color of gold itself, it has to do a lot with the chemistry. So as you can see over here, red gold itself, why is red gold? It's because it's only gold and copper. So copper with the brass itself, it will give you the red color. Then for rose gold itself, it's also high in copper, but with some silver as well, so that the uh, coloring is more bronze rather than red. Then we have pink gold, etc. So these are the typical range of concentration for the different that creates the coloring of the gold itself. And last but not least, we have this interesting one that uh, has only been in the market for uh, I think five to ten years, which is the purple gold. So purple gold is very interesting because it's actually a combination of gold and aluminium, so which gives it the purple color itself. So uh, this is not very commonly found in the market. So in terms of the classifications of gold, when we talk about 18 carat of gold, it means 18 parts of gold and six parts of additional metals, making it 75% gold. So 14 carat is around 58.3, 12 carat is 50%. And of course, like 24 carat is 99.99% of gold. So in the Asian market itself, typically we look uh, at heritage, but in the European market, uh, how they look at it is they use the term fineness instead of heritage. So example for uh, 18 karat gold is actually marked as 750 fineness, which will indicate that it's 75% 75 of gold. Then when it's marked as uh, 585 fineness is actually meaning of 58.5% of gold. So uh, this actually just relates to the percentage of uh, gold in the sample. Okay. So uh, one thing that I want to mention here is about the manufacturing process of uh, gold 
or jewelry itself? And what are some of the challenges that we face during the manufacturing process? Okay. So as we know, uh, when we want to make gold, it involves melting and casting. So with melting and casting, it's actually determined, it's actually very heavily dependent on the chemical and physical properties of the materials that you use. So temperature is actually a key factor because different elements or different material have different melting points. Okay, and especially for gold, it has the highest melting point compared to the other common materials such as copper, nickel, zinc, etc. Okay, so what happened during solidification when we are doing the casting is that the solid form at different time of the process has different composition because of the different melting points of the material. I mean, unless we're talking about pure gold, but if we are talking about things like 22 karat gold or 21 karat gold or 18 karat gold, we will have different materials mixed into the, material, uh, the, the gold itself. So the remaining liquid will gradually have less of the element with the higher melting point. Okay, so when this happens, if the casting and melting process is not done properly, it might cause different parts to have different composition. So if the temperature is not being controlled well enough, so when you are doing this casting itself, it might cause the entire material to have very, very different composition. I mean, uh, if I talk about an extreme case, you might have half of gold and half of copper if really nothing is done. So it really, temperature is really a key and that is why uh, a lot of times uh, gold is not as homogeneous as what we think as compared to alloys such as stainless steel, inconels, brass, etc. Okay, so this is something that uh, I wanted to share a little bit more to let everyone understand that uh, during casting and melting, it actually affects the homogeneity of the sample itself. And later on, I will explain why and how this can impact the analysis by using XRF, okay? So next, uh, determining goal purity, okay? So before I move on, I would like to pose out a poll question. Okay, so I would love to ask everyone, uh, are everyone on this call, on this webinar itself, are you guys doing any tests on your goal? Okay, I think it's very good. I'm seeing that there's almost 75% uh, of you guys that have uh, answered that you guys are actually performing some sort of test on the goal itself, okay? So uh, next, moving forward, I will start to discuss a little bit more about the different types of uh, goal analysis method. Okay, so over here, I have this uh, chart. So you can see on one end of it is showing non-destructive, the other end is showing destructive. On the top end is showing all elements and at the bottom is showing only gold. So this means that uh, it was only the equip the method is only able to give you gold concentration. And over here on top means is the method is able to give you uh, the complete composition of the sample itself. Okay, then over here, this portion will be the non that the matter is non destructive, and over here, it'll be that the matter is destructive. Okay, so first of all, I will go through this uh, method that what we call touchstone method. Okay, so what happened in touchstone method is actually by using acid, so there will be different concentration of acid that will be provided. So you will like have a 10K acid, a 14K, 18K, and 22K acid. So what happened is when you, you will need to scratch the gold on this surface itself. So that's why it will create some sort of a destructive method because at the end of the day, you are scratching the jewelry itself. So when you put, example, if you're using the 14 carat, okay? So if you put the 14 carat on here. So example, if it dissolve, means that it is actually uh, lower, co higher concentration, but if it doesn't dissolve, means that this is the concentration. So example, if you use the 18 carat solution, so if you put it on the 
it will remain as when you put it on the 18 carat, it will remain as uh, not, not being able to dissolve. So this is how we are able to identify what is the uh, purity of the uh, sample itself. However, this is only more of an estimation on what is the heritage. So it will not be able to give you the exact gold percentage. Let's say it won't be able to give you 75% of gold or whether it's the 76% of gold or 77% of gold. Okay, so this is more like a qualitative testing. Okay, next, uh, there we are able to use conductivity as well. So for conductivity as well, one important thing is that uh, at times the surface of the sample actually means a lot. Why I say by that is because if the surface is dirty or if the surface has a coating or there's a plastic cover on top, the conductivity pen might not work because uh, there is no direct, you are not able to directly contact with the sample, the gold sample itself and uh, the conductivity won't go through. So sometimes you will need to clean the sample or you might even need to do a certain level of polishing or, uh, uh, or polishing itself to make it uh, smooth or make it uh, make the surface clean so that you are able to use a conductivity pen. And as well, it's only able to give you more of a heritage rather than the actual composition. Okay. Then uh, I will talk about the fire assay. So fire assay, I think this is a very well-known method in the industry. As, so this is a destructive method. So you will need to it's a very tedious method and it must be done. It can only be done in a laboratory with a skilled personnel. So you will not be able to do this on the spot and you will not be able to get a results real time, unlike the touchstone or the conductivity pen. Okay. And also for this method itself, uh, the goal needs to be digested by acid. So you will not be able to recover your goal as well. However, fire assay will give you an accurate reading of the gold purity itself, okay? But uh, fire assay is only meant for precious metal. So if we look, so it won't be able to give you uh, any readings on things like copper, zinc, nickel, etc. So it will only be able to give you the concentration of gold, okay? Next, we have uh, ICP OES as well. So for ICP OES, uh, you, it's a destructive method as well. So you can do acid digestion to digest the sample, followed by running it through the ICP OES. So with the ICP OES, you will be able to get a full composition. So you will be able to get the gold, copper, nickel, zinc concentration if the ICP is calibrated for it. However, similar to the fire assay, the sample has to be digested using acid. Therefore, you won't be able to recover the material itself, okay? And so for a lot of times for ICP or fire assay, I will always tell the customer that you are not just paying for the test itself, for the third party testing itself, but rather you are also losing gold. And at times it, it might be, a, as 0 0.5 gram or even one gram of gold, which can cost, which is actually value to everyone as well. Next, if we talk about a non-destructive method, it, it will be, uh, there's a method that's using density. So there's a density meter, which is uh, dependent on the weight of the sample. So by measuring the weight, you will be able to give you an estimation of what is the heritage of the material itself. However, for density meter, because it's by weight, uh, that we might have issues when we are measuring items or jewelries with gemstone, diamonds, or even if the sample is a uh, fake gold, whereby it might be coated with gold, but the base is tungsten or lead, we will not be able to identify it with the density meter because the uh, density of tungsten and lead is pretty similar to that of the gold, okay? So last but not least, of course, um, we'll talk about portable XRF or XRF technology in short. 
So with the XRF technology, in short, number one, it is non-destructive. Okay, so uh, no sample prep is required. You do not need to polish your sample. You can test on the sample immediately, and it will be able to provide you with the full elemental composition of the material. Okay, so next, I will explain on uh, how does XRF work itself. Okay, so what happened is the X-ray tube will send out an X-ray, which will kick out the innermost electron. Then the one nearest, the electron nearest to it will replace the one that's being kicked out. And when this happens, a unique fluorescent is uh, created. So our detector will capture this unique fluorescent energy. Then we will process it. Then we'll be able to get the elemental composition of the sample itself. Okay. So with this technology itself, it's a very simple uh, technology. So next, I will talk about uh, using portable XRF for gold analysis. Of, okay, so over here, you can see there's a ring. And this is exactly why I uh, discussed a little bit about the manufacturing process itself, just because of sample homogeneity issue. Okay, so because, of, because it's very difficult to control the casting and melting process itself. So turns out that at the end of the day, the jewelry that has been made it won't have very homogeneous surfaces. So what I mean by that is that example over here, like XRF, you will, if we do, were to take three spots, you can see that one spot might give you 75, second will give you 75.4, it might give you 74.6, okay? So you will not see that you will get 75% exactly at every single spot, just because the uh, process itself is actually very difficult to control. So what happened is for fire assay, it is only taking a small portion of the sample. Because remember what I said earlier, the ring itself actually costs money as well. So we are, we are not able to provide the testing lab, the entire ring for testing. So effectively, a lot of times the fire assay is actually only looking at around probably 0 0.5 gram to one gram of the sample. And with this, it might not be representative of the whole sample. Or probably we might want to take a pinch of salt when we are looking at fire assay result comparing with other technology, because we must bear in mind that, as I mentioned, fire assay only takes a small portion of the sample. It does not take every single or multiple portion of the sample, because if you are, take, if you are taking another spot, it's costing you additional money. Okay, so with XRF, because it's non-destructive, we can measure more locations. So we can compare concentration at different locations. Then we can take an average that to have a better representative of the whole sample, okay? And over here, one thing that I would really like to stress to everyone over here as well is that the XRF technology is not here to help you identify whether the sample is a real goal or a fake goal. But rather, the XRF technology is really to provide you guys with a purity check of the concentration of gold in the sample itself. It is for you to verify that your 22K is actually a 916 or 92% gold, or your, or your 18K is actually a 75% or 75 or 76% gold. So that is the ultimate purpose of the XRF. But saying this, there are some tips that uh, throughout my time in Olympus, I have visited many countries. I've visited many uh, pawn shops, pawn brokers, or jewelry shops. I gained some experience and how we can use the XRF to spot, spot the uh, fake goal is that first of all, we can test on multiple spots. So when we are testing on multiple spots itself, if the concentration is as such, if it's 75, 74, 74 74.6, it's still not that bad. It means that the sample is genuine. However, if we were to test this spot is giving 75, if we test this spot is giving 65%, then this will actually bring out an alarm to me that say that, oh, why is this spot 65%? There might be something wrong with the sample. And this is where I will start investigating more just to verify whether this is a real or fake sample. Or example, if you're measuring a coin itself, 
the, the size of the coins have jagged edges, so it's pretty difficult to code homogeneously. So I might focus on the jagged edges and perform the analysis just to make sure that it is the content that is stated. So these are more of trips and uh, tips that uh, we can, how, how we can use the XRF to differentiate whether the material is uh, real or fake. And also sometimes when we are looking at uh, gold coated materials, if we are able to, uh, if we are, if we see some elements such as cadmium, which is a toxic element itself that typically is not present in jewelry, it actually gives me an alarm as well that the sample might be coated because uh, cadmium is actually an element that it has been widely used for stabilizer for coatings. So if we see that, this might give you guys an indication as well. So with XRF itself, as I mentioned earlier, it's a complete analysis. So you will be able to list out whatever elements that have been detected on the sample itself. So through this, with experience, you will be able to, you can, you can use the data to determine whether this sample is real or not, okay? So we have also done very extensive testing comparing with a uh, fire assay result and with our XRF data. So you can see that this is a chart comparing between 40 plus percent of gold all the way up to around 70 plus percent of gold. So this is these are all samples that we have tested and we have compared with the fire assay results. So you can see that we have a very, very, very good correlation between the fire assay result as well. So this is for gold and this is for silver. Okay. So extensive work has been done with the equipment to calibrate it so that it reads accurately for precious metals. Okay. So uh, that's just some... Uh, experience that I would like to share with using the XRF for gold. So now I will start talking about something that is more interesting to you guys, which is about gemstones, okay? So as we know, there are many, many, many different types of gemstones around. So there can be, there's diamond, there's ruby, there's quartz, there's uh, topaz, moonstone, etc. okay? So that being said, for some of the gemstone, they have special characteristics. So example, like Ruby, it has 69%, it's supposed to have 69% of aluminum, 0.9% of silicon, uh, some titanium, some iron. So with all these elements that we have listed over here, so these are the elements that we are able to use our XRF to analyze and to find the composition of the same material itself. So through that, we have done several studies or we have some, done some testing with some of our customers and we were able to identify or perform some analysis of certain gemstones, okay? So next, uh, I'll be sharing three case study on, on how we done testings on gemstones, okay? So first of all is identifying authentic diamonds. Okay, so we have a case study that uh, we have a real diamond and a cubic zirconium sample. So as you can see over here in these two photos, figure one and figure two, they are a necklace. So if you can see, we are able to collimate to a three event spot so that we can measure the, the diamonds directly. And as you can see that there's not much, there's really not much difference from how the sample actually looks like. Just by visual, we probably unable to determine whether it's a real or fake diamond. However, if we take a look at the XRF result, for diamond, because it's pure carbon, which is out of our elemental range, so typically we will not detect any element at all, which you can see over here, so there's no element detected. However, for the cubic zirconium, it actually contains high level of zirconium, which can be easily detected by the XRF. So over here, this is where you will see that, you can see that there's actually around 60% of zirconium found in this gemstone itself. And for the real diamond, there's actually nothing at all. So from this, we are able to find to or conclude that 
whether there's any so called the presence or essence of zirconium actually can differentiate between real or fake diamond. Or even for some of the synthetic diamonds that we have seen in the market, some of them might be using quartz as well. So even for quartz itself, it's actually SiO2. So for SiO2 itself, our equipment is able to detect silicon as well. So if we detect silicon, then we will be able to identify the difference between a real diamond and a fake one or uh, quartz itself. So this is how by using the XRF uh, technology itself that of the capability that we can measure elemental concentration, this is how we can use it to separate between uh, real and fake gemstones. Okay. The second one is we're talking about real and fake pearls. So as you can see over here, real pearl composition is actually nearly all calcium carbonate. Okay, with some traces of organic or inorganic material. And over here, you can see both necklace looks similar under for visual as well. But if we look at the concentration itself over here, figure three shows with the real pearl, it actually shows around 81% of calcium carbonate, whereas for figure four, it's only showing around 1.4% of calcium carbonate. So from this as well, we are able to determine what is the concentration, uh, what, whether this pearl is a real or fake pearl as well, okay? So all in all, it's, it's more about how we use the chemistry to identify the authenticity of gemstones, okay? And for the last case study, we are talking about real versus fake turquoise, okay? So real turquoise is actually a hydrous aluminum phosphate with a copper base, okay? So by using copper, phosphorus, and aluminum, we are able to determine the authenticity, okay? So it's the same as the previous two case study. Over here, you, when you see that the aluminum, phosphorus, and con copper content are high, we can tell that this is actually a real turquoise. Whereas if we look at the fake turquoise, we can see that there's no phosphorus and even aluminum and copper is at very, very low concentration. Okay, so what I would like to say is ultimately the XRF is a tool for everyone to use to determine the chemistry of the material. But how we use this data is, uh, how we can use this data to help us with our interpretation is really uh, dependent on the application itself. And as I shared earlier in the, this previous slide is that uh, different gemstone, they do have different type of composition. And if we know what is the composition of this gemstone, we can then set a criteria in the XRF as well to do a pass fail analysis, whether does this uh, sample matches the gemstones that we are looking at, okay? So uh, last but not least, I would like to touch on the final aspects. Why is the advantage of the Olympus uh, Vanta handheld equipment, okay? So uh, first of all, it's able to give you on the spot carrot classification. It's also able to give you real-time result, meaning to say that uh, you can probably get a result in 30 seconds to 60 seconds. It's portable. You can bring it everywhere you go. It's non-destructive. It will not cause any damage to your sample. Then as I mentioned earlier, it will give you the full composition analysis. So it will tell you what is the gold concentration, what is the uh, copper, concentration, zinc concentration, silver as well. Then at the top, it also give you what is the heritage, okay? Uh, with the Vanta as well, you are able to use our external camera to take a full photo of the sample, which you can then attach to a simple PDF report, okay? We do have an aiming camera as well, so you can determine which spot of the sample you want to measure as well. So this is actually a 3mm collimator then uh, you can create a simple PDF report for archive archiving. 
So as I mentioned just now, you can actually have your aiming image over here with the spot and your external sample image as well. Then over here, this will be your chemistry result. You can also input your company logo as well. So this is a simple uh, a one click report that you can export. Okay. And uh, lastly, for smaller items or jewelry, you can actually convert into this uh, mini bench shop system as well with our optional uh, workstation accessory. So with this, you can actually connect to a laptop, then you can operate from a laptop as well. And if, if for go by itself, you can use, probably use it as a handheld just to measure directly. And also uh, one thing that I forgot to mention over uh, to input over here is uh, also that with, our, with the XRF itself, you can measure across plastic as well. So I understand that in the commercial market itself, uh, there are a lot of small bars, school bars, like the 10, 10 gram bars, et cetera, that is most of the time is silk with a uh, plastic. And once the silk is broken, the value of the, uh, the item itself will be depreciated. So with the SRF itself, uh, we are able to test through the plastic material to help you identify whether it's a 24 karat gold. Okay, so you do not need to open the uh, plastic container or the plastic plastic wrapping itself before you can analyze with our equipment. Okay. So uh, last of all, I will start going through some of the questions in the Q&A session. Okay, so uh, first of all, I have a question, how deep can it penetrate? So uh, in terms of alloy material itself, or when we talk about jewelry itself, it's actually around 20 to 30 microns. So it's actually, so XRF technology is actually a very, surface type of measurement. So it will only be able to measure up to 20 to 30 microns. So uh, a lot of times if the sample is electroplated, typically electroplating is pretty thin. It ranges from around 10 micron to 15 micron. So if a sample is electroplated, it can be easily identified by our XRF, our Vanta, and it will actually show a message saying that, oh, go coating possible, please investigate. Okay, however, with uh, advancement of technology as well, and as people start to know the limitation of the technology itself, uh, they came up with a more robust method of coating. So now instead of using electroplating, they actually use coating. So when they coat the material, they will coat it thicker than 30 microns so that it can uh, trick the XRF. However, as I mentioned, because uh, in terms of coating itself, it's very difficult to have a very a super homogeneous uh, coating because uh, different spot might be different concentration or there might be uneven surfaces that might be difficult to coat. So all in all, if you want, you can always try to use the XRF to measure multiple locations on the sample itself if you do suspect that this sample is a fake goal. And of course, I know in this industry of precious metal, uh, we rely a lot on experience and a lot on visuals and feeling. So I mean, what, I'm, what I mean by that is that uh, first layer will always be looking at the color of the gold itself, then also by the weight itself. Then, I mean, to be honest, the XRF is really there to provide you guys with additional data in your interpretation to help you guys make a better judgment on the sample itself, okay? Uh, I have a question about lab room diamonds, okay? So uh, for lab room diamonds itself, uh, as, as, I un as for my understanding itself, it might be still using carbon material, but it's more of a way on how they process the material, okay? So they might be using things like uh, graphite that can be easily available compared to diamond and then doing some processing to make it uh, into similar to diamond. So if it's only using graphite, unfortunately graphite is carbon as well. So we are unable to detect it, but uh, let me dig a little bit deeper into this lab grown diamonds and probably uh, I can come back to you with uh, some more answers. But uh, as per my understanding in the industry itself, there are many people doing some research as well on how 
they can use quotes to mimic diamond as well. So that is why I brought up the uh, thing about quotes in, when I was discussing about the gemstone earlier. Okay. Uh, next, I have another question. Can the gold expert determine the gemstone with geochem? So unfortunately, the gold expert is a model that we have created purely for the precious metal analysis. So meaning to say it is only suitable to measure uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, etc. So it's more suited to use for precious metal and it's unable to measure uh, the light elements that you see earlier, things like aluminium, magnesium, silicon. Okay. So with that, you probably have to go with a handheld equipment. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's the same question. Uh, is it possible to test a gemstone when it is already in a goal setting? Uh, yes. So if it's in a goal setting, so if we have the, as you can see just now, we can use a 3mm collimator. So example, uh, it's typical to have diamonds or gemstones on a ring. So what you can do is just position the gemstone and fill up the 3mm collimation then it will focus on the gemstone itself and not on the gold. Okay. Uh, how deep can your XR scan? I already answered that. Okay. Can the device be used for testing liquid sample? Uh, yes, it can be testing used for testing liquid sample. However, you will need to use a specific uh, calibration and a specific sample preparation in order to uh, test on liquid sample. However, we, uh, I need to understand a little bit more on what kind of uh, requirements are you looking at for the liquid sample itself. So I'll probably take this offline and we, may, we will contact you to discuss a little bit more about your application. Okay. So uh, last question, uh, can this Fanta be used with ultrasonic density meter? Do we have any solution? Okay. So, uh, when we talk about jewelry analysis, uh, pretty much it's more of using XRF because the sample is small. However, if we are talking about gold bar analysis itself, uh, I mean, just coincidentally, you have this uh, photo over here. So when we're testing a gold bar, what happened is that uh, gold bar is the most common when uh, people want to create fake bars. Okay, So what they will do is they will use tungsten or lead as the base and then coat the material uh, with gold, okay? So when we are measuring gold bars as well, especially like uh, this one kg bar that you are looking at over here. So what we can do is that we will use the XRF to do a surface measurement. So we will test multiple spots on the gold bar itself to make sure that it's uh, a pure gold bar, if that is a uh, 99.99% gold bar. Then uh, in Olympus, we do have another technology that is using ultrasound, okay? So by using ultrasound itself, uh, we are able to determine whether is there any uh, insert in the sample itself. Uh, let me quickly pull this out to, to show it to you guys. Okay, so uh, I, I sorry to, that I need to share our screen instead of uh, in the presentation. So in our Olympus Dash IMS website, we do have several uh, resources or application notes that you can view regarding Go as well. So uh, in terms of <clears throat> Go by itself, as I said, we do have a specific application note for that. So uh, what I wanted to say is that we do have uh, ultrasonic equipment that you can use. So the ultrasonic equipment is similar to <clears throat> what uh, pregnant ladies that when go for checkup, they want the doctor will do an ultrasound scan on their fetal, on the fetus itself. So it's actually a similar technology, but we actually use it more for industrial purposes. So what happened is over here, you can see this is the probe. So the ultrasonic probe will actually sound, send a signal, a wave down to the bottom of the wall. So when it reaches the bottom of the wall, the signal will hit back, will, will bounce back to the probe. So when this happens, we are able to measure what is the thickness of 
uh, this sample itself. So example, if it's a real gold, and of course, uh, different materials will have, have its different velocity. So in ultrasound, we're actually looking at the velocity itself of different material. So different material have different velocity. So if the material is homogeneous or if, there, if there's only one material, it should go all the way down and come back. So over here, you might see that, oh, it's actually a 5 cm or 50 mm thickness. But if there is something in the middle, what happened is that the ultrasound wave will still go down, but instead of reaching all the way to the bottom, it will hit the material and it will go back. So when this happened, it will start showing you that, oh, yes, it's only 30 mm. So this is how you will be able to know that, oh, there is a, something insert in the sample itself. So you can actually scan the whole go bar. I mean, it only takes you like maybe less than a minute to scan the whole go bar. So you can scan the whole go bar. Then from there, you can make sure that if the go bar actual thickness is 50 mm, when you're scanning the whole go bar, it should show you 50 mm. So once you see that on a certain region is showing you uh, 30 mm, then something is wrong. Then there might be a insert and you might probably want to investigate further. Okay, so in Olympus, yes, we do provide uh, this, uh, device as well. It's actually called an ultrasonic flaw detector. So uh, if you are interested, we can actually contact you to share a few more or even do an online uh, demo with you guys. Okay. So uh, I have a quick question. Can you test palladium, platinum? Yes, we are able to test all the precious metal, uh, palladium, platinum, uh, gold, silver, even tungsten. We are able to test tungsten as well. So if the material has uh, tungsten, we are able to identify that it's tungsten and it's not gold, okay? Okay, I think we are running out of time now. So uh, unfortunately, we are unable to answer every single questions in this, but however, uh, I will actually make another, oh, Iridium, yes, we are able to, measure iridium as well. So for some of the questions that have not been answered today, we will actually follow up with you. Our salesperson will actually contact you to discuss further with you guys. And uh, we will be sending out a short survey later as well. And if you are interested, we can always arrange an online demo with you guys or a physical visit with you guys. Okay. So if you have any further question, you can always look for any Olympus representative or you can actually go to our Olympus-IMS website and uh, give us uh, a summary and inquiry and we will follow up with you on your questions. Okay. Uh, if not, I would like to thank everyone for taking out time off today as well to participate in this webinar. And I, I really hope that you guys uh, learned something. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to contact any one of us and submit an inquiry and we will follow up with you guys. Okay, if not, uh, thank you very much. Have a good day ahead.